Failure. 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 These these video devices are built really, 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 really awesome. They spend a lot of engineering into them to make sure these things work really well. The biggest cause of failure with this is how they're installed. How they're installed. Uh, like most people do, I think. Human error. So you have one issue of the refrigerant that comes to this meter device needs to be clean. Right? If it's not clean, there's moving parts in there, and you're going to clog up those moving parts. It's not going to work right. In the old days, we'd do a lot of off-roading and stuff. We had carburetors, and we'd get dirt in those carburetor pieces, and it would hang open or it wouldn't open. It would cause all kinds of havoc. So having dirt in there, they say like three grains of sand can, can stop it up. Now, there should never be sand in there, so, but it gives you an idea how, how little contaminants it can be. So when people cut the copper, uh, then they ream it out, and when they ream it out, some of those little copper shavings, and that copper shavings can get hung up in here. When they braze the refrigerant lines together, which we'll be doing later, they a lot of times don't braze with nitrogen. And if you don't braze with nitrogen, you get oxidation because there's oxygen inside. Oxidation then washes off the lines when the refrigerant flows through, and that oxidation can build up inside of there. Somebody can pull a vacuum improperly and not pull a good vacuum, get moisture in the lines, and the moisture will freeze, turn the solids, and freeze the moving parts so they can't move. Uh, people, I have seen people before, like, oh, they're not going to change the filter dryer. So they don't change the filter dryer, and it gets clogged up, and it lets stuff either pass on by or come apart even, and that causes that to be a problem. So that's one thing is contaminants like that from human error. Ideally, anything before the metering device will get caught here, but if you can only catch so much moisture, you can only do so much. Anything past that metering device. Now, in my day, we always put the filter dryer before the metering device. If you have a unit in the closet in the house, it's not too big of a deal, except the unit's up in the attic, and you got to do work out here. I don't know anybody that's going to carry all their torch set up to the attic to cut the lines just to put the filter dryer there. I don't, I don't see that happening. Are those directional? Yes. So it has an arrow, so I can put it here as long as the arrow is pointing that way, or I can put it outside as long as the arrow is pointing that way, or halfway in the middle as long as the arrow is pointing that way. Anywhere on this liquid line, I can put it. Any place on there. Uh, we used to put them before the metering device so that they would protect the metering device. But like I say, nobody's going to carry a torch set all the way up in the attic when it's 115, light the torch up with all the wood and everything around them, trying to balance on the 2x4s just to put the, the filter dryer there. You're going to end up putting it outside. If I have closet units, I, I preferred to put them inside. Uh, that way they're protected in the metering device. But um, there's other reasons. Once we get the heat pumps, you see other reasons that that's not the only place they can go as well. You only can use one dryer? Yes, only one. If I have two, only one's going to work. The other's just going to be a restriction. So the other thing is, uh, when we get this unit, uh, some of them come with them already there, some of them you have to put it in yourself. But a lot of times this piece will be behind the panel, behind the box of the unit, and all your, your brazing parts where you hook up to the copper is going to be outside. This will be mounted inside, but where you braze up to it will be outside the box. So people don't think to open the box up and see what's inside or what's happening in there. So what they do is they hook the lines up together, light their torch, and start brazing this copper, which is very high temperature. What, what is this again, the name of this component? Uh, sensing, bulb. sensing bulb. This sensing bulb is sensitive and sensing temperature. Right? Very small. You guys saw it didn't take much temperature change to start adjusting and opening and closing. So if you get this blazing hot, it's going to get that hot, which is going to cause a pressure increase, temperature increase, pressure increase, which is going to put more pressure on that sensing bulb, that diaphragm of that TXV, and you're going to damage that TXV. So people notoriously... Braze with that on, cause the overpressure, and it may not damage right away. It may take a month or two months or a year or two years even, but it will damage it. And it overextends that moving part in there, and that diaphragm inside will be uh, damaged. You can rip it or weaken it, etc. So that's a big problem. Now, the best thing to do is take that sensing bulb off, completely loose from that line. Braze it up. Once it's done and cool, you can put it back on. You can also use uh, wet rags and uh, heat absorbing paste. What are wet rags going to keep that temperature at? Saturation. Wet rags? Saturation, which will be? Right? So what's the pressure on the wet rags? Zero PSI. So what temperature is it going to boil at? Zero. 
Water's gonna boil at zero degrees? A wet rag, okay, a wet rag. I go to the faucet, I have a rag, I put water on it, it's now a wet rag, okay? I wrap that around a piece of copper and use a torch at very high temperature heat in the copper. That heat is gonna transfer to that wet rag. That wet rag can only heat up to what temperature? There we go, now we're there. You did, but you said it before we got, we were leading there. So that wet rag can only keep it to 212. By keeping it at 212, we're going to help protect that sensing bulb, but the better way is, don't even get it that hot. Take it off. Okay, so then we also have to braise this side. I can't take this piece off, so we have to wrap, wrap it with wet rags. I think uh, Dan Foss, they recommend theirs at like 208, which is really odd because you can only keep it at 212 because you're wet rags. But they also make heat absorbing paste. Um, it's a brand called uh, New Calgon that makes a really nice heat absorbing paste. There's some other ones I like, but New Calgon is my favorite. You put that on, this heat absorbing paste, it's uh, like goo, and it changes state. It starts to harden up, and there's change of state from the, the material they use, and it helps prevent the heat from going into that TXV. It keeps it from being damaged. But notoriously, people will be brazing on this, and that heat goes right in there to that spring, and heat affects springs, how springs work. So it'll damage how the spring's working. There's a little rod in there. That rod can get warped. There's Teflon rings in there that can melt. You can cause all kinds of damage to this TXV from heat. And it may not happen right away. It may be a month, a week, two weeks, an hour, a year from then. But then you have people coming back and going, wow, these TXVs are junk. I replace them all the time. Everyone in my company puts in, we're having to replace. Oh, wait, everyone your company's putting in, you're having to replace. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe there's a problem with how your company's doing it. Uh, we had an installer uh, that was putting these in. We were having problems, and so I showed up and asked him, are you guys wrapping those TXVs? Oh, yeah, yeah, we're wrapping them. So I showed up on the job and brought some, uh, some, some uh, drinks. Hey, why you guys some drinks and some burritos? And text everybody those burritos. And uh, thanks, man. So now they're opened up to you. So now that they're distracted with their drinks and burritos that go in, they just got done brazing. No wet rags, no water anywhere, nothing around. This got done brazing it. So I knew immediately what the problem was. Did, right? so, did you take the burrito back? <laughs> <laughs> no, it was beyond the point of return. Um, so uh, it's a big issue. I feel like, oh, and the installers don't see it. Their, their job is to try to get that done and out of there as fast as possible. Yeah. So they're not thinking about the long-term effects, but it is long-term effects for that customer. It's a very big problem. Cannot overheat that TXV. Some people will put the wet rags on it and be brazing, and all the water will boil into a vapor, and they just keep on brazing. Well, maybe you have to stop and get the rag wet again, or get more wet rags. But once it all boils away, the temperature is going to go up. So boiling is a cooling effect. That water boiling is keeping it cool at a nice 212. So those are your two biggest things that cause the TXVs to fail. At one point, there was an issue with a compressor manufacturer that put an oil additive in the system. And this oil additive was a type of, I think, rust inhibitor. And this oil additive reacted with some of the refrigerant or refrigerant oil or something. And it actually got hung up in the TXVs and turned into a type of goo. And it started causing problems with the TXV. Uh, completely, that was the only one that I've seen they had failures outside of standard operating conditions. And there was a big deal about that and some lawsuits involved and everybody's pointing fingers at somebody else. but. It was a pretty big deal. So TXVs, any questions about that? No? What's the best way to install them? Oh, to install one, good, good question. Some units come with them already there. They're already in the unit, ready to go, fantastic. Other units, they come with a fixed orifice, which means there's a threaded fitting, and you unthread it, and the fixed orifice is inside. Uh, so they manufacture these units for everybody's sake. So let's say, this section of the classroom here, this way, wants it done right, wants, it, wants a, a better operating system. And versus a fixed hole, a fixed orifice, the conditions are going to change, everything else is going to change, versus the TXV that's going to adjust under reasonable conditions to try to maintain a superheat. So they know that that TXV is very valuable. Now these guys from this part of the class here, they're like, hey, I'm in business to make money, only money. I care about doing it, making money on everything I can, and I just want it done cheap. It's still going to work. It's still going to have cooling. I don't care about the details of the efficiency. I just want it done cheap. So the manufacturer says, okay, 
uh, we need to be able to sell my unit to both sides. And if I put TXVs, make one with TXV and make another one without, that's twice as much units I have to make. And my supply guy, supply house, they have to have more room to store more of these units. So what they do is they make one unit, and they make them with a fixed orifice metering device. One unit for everybody. And these guys are like, you know what, I like TXVs. And they say, yes, you're right. And we agree the TXD is better. So what we're going to have is we're going to sell you the units, and for so much money more, like 50 bucks, 100 bucks more, we're going to save the TXV kit. And you just put it in. So now everybody's happy. So putting these in, they get really complicated. Um, there we go. This is what I want. All right, so if I get the TXV that matches this unit, there's a threaded fitting on there, and we braze this side up. If I unhook that threaded fitting and open it up, that little fixed orifice that we passed around last week, that little piece of brass is in there. I take that, and I throw it away. That's gone. Now, this will have the same exact fittings that was on here. So this piece, I screw on where that orifice was, and it's got this extension so that you, you can't hook it up with the orifice in there. You have to remove it. And the other piece that screwed on, I screw it on right here. Done. I mount this with a little hose clamp on the suction line. Done. And sometimes you have to drill a hole and braze this in, but most of them have a, um, a threaded piece that will fit on there. I don't think those did. Oh, where's that one? That, I... that one. If we hold that one up, the suction pipe, the big pipe, the other pipe, the, the, yeah, see how it has a threaded fitting on it? Some of them just already have a port there with the threaded fitting ready to go. Some of them leave you that actual piece of suction line that you can braze the suction line in and it has the port already on there. But either way, you uh, mount the suction line, screw that on, screw this on, screw that on. Now finish installing it like you normally do. It's easy. If the system hasn't been started up yet, it's easy. Yes? That's what I was going to ask. So if it's brand new, do you still have to change out the filter? If no? it's brand new, you're going to put one in from the beginning. Okay. Like put a new one in. With, along with the... Along with, well, even if, whether I installed the TXV or didn't install the TXV, you're still going to have to deal with your, your filter dryer. So, if I have a customer, though, that has a system operating with a fixed orifice, I'm like, hey, this is better, now it's going to be a problem. Because now to install it, i got to take all the refrigerant out of the system. And then I have to install the, fil the, the metering device, then I have to put a new filter uh, dryer in there, then I have to pressure test to make sure it's not leaking, and then I have to pull a good deep vacuum, then i got to recharge the refrigerant. So now there's a lot of money and steps involved. But when it's new, it's like $50, $100 difference between a TXV working awesome and a fixed orifice working horrible. Under, and you're going to see the, the, the guys that use the fixed orifice, their excuse will be, well, according to the ratings, they have the same efficiency ratings. And that's true. But they test them in a factory where you have ARI conditions of a set evaporator temperature and humidity temperature and a set outdoor temperature. So this will close down or open up to the same exact point that that fixed orifice is for those conditions and under those conditions it will operate. But outside those conditions, this is going to blow that thing away. It's going to be awesome. So I'll give you an example of what's happening. As the outdoor temperature outside goes up, what happens to the pressure out here? Goes up, good. So I have more pressure pushing against more liquid. That means I'm pushing more liquid through this metering device, which that means I end up with more liquid on the other side of this metering device. Right? So the outdoor temperature, will that affect your, in, uh, your indoor superheat? Yes. Yes. With a fixed orifice, yes. As the temperature outside drops, what happens to the pressure outside? Drops. 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 Uh, well, does that affect how much refrigerant is being pushed to that yeah. fixed hole? Yeah. So the outdoor temperature is going to affect the indoor superheat. And... The temperature inside the house. As the temperature in the house goes up, is that going to affect my superheat? Yeah. As the temperature inside the house goes down, is that going to affect my superheat? Yeah. My humidity. As my humidity goes up, I have more latent heat to take out of the house. Is that going to affect my superheat? Yeah. As my humidity goes down, is that going to affect my superheat? Yeah. All right, so now what happens when your outdoor temperature goes up, but your indoor temperature goes down, but your indoor humidity goes up? Oh, well, now we're all over the place, right? Yeah. Well... This guy doesn't care what the conditions are going to be within a reasonable expectations. They're going to open and close as it needs to try to maintain optimum performance of that system. <laughs> you just have to give it enough subcooling. 
How cool is that? Yeah, it is. So some of you are only going to be concerned about installing it cheap. That's it. That's all I care about. Others, they went and installed the TXV. I love TXVs. I always preferred the TXV. I knew a guy who hated uh, TXVs. Well, those things are failing all the time. Hmm. Why? <laughs> why are they failing? So uh, he would actually go, and, and this, this made me mad. He would say, oh, we'll go. Uh, I, every time I see a TXV, I like to cut them out and put a fixed orifice in there. Oh. <laughs> what? What? You're downgrading people's systems. Yeah, exactly. Because he, he didn't like the other one. It's like, well, it doesn't matter what you like. You're not going to... Like, you know, I don't like uh, my dad. Um, he, he's, he's anti-computers and a lot of stuff. He's, he's getting better now. But um, didn't like computers and stuff. And he doesn't use cruise control. He doesn't want a computer controlling his vehicle. I'm like, Dad, never mind. I'm not even going to go there. But uh, I love my dad. But he, is, he doesn't want a computer controlling his vehicle. But uh, so it'd be like him saying he doesn't like cruise control. He's going to take cruise control out of everybody's cars that he works on. Okay? So it, it's ridiculous, right? So TXVs are like cruise control. You set the cruise control, and as the conditions change, it's going to give it more gas or less gas as it needs to try to maintain a reasonable speed. A fixed orifice is like taking a, a pipe and pushing the pipe on a gas pedal a certain amount and then locking that pipe in place. So we exactly have this much gas pedal going on. So what happens when you have, uh, and, and under factory conditions, the car with cruise control is going to be going, say, 60, and the car with the, uh, the, the piece of pipe hooked up is going to be going 60. But what happens when you hit a hill? The car with the pipe is going to go slower, and the cruise control is going to give it more gas and going up the hill. And then when you're coming down the hill... The car with the pipe is in trouble. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, uh, the, the other one, the cruise control is going to back off, but the one with the pipe is going to go, whoa, going to be flying down that hill. And then what if you have more people in the car? Oh, yeah, right? And then less people in the car. What about a headwind, the tailwind? Now, what about a headwind with fewer people in the car, but going, right, all these variables start clicking in, whereas the cruise control is going to adjust for those variables, and the fixed orbit is going to be like the pipe on the gas pedal and just having this much gas go through it. It's horrible, horrible, but uh, it, it doesn't, the pipe doesn't, uh, the fixed orifice one, very little failure, there's very little to go wrong. You can leave that in there and braze the heck out of it, and even though there's still a Teflon ring for the seal, it's less likely to have any problems than all the moving parts. What's the lifetime on it? What's that? What's the lifetime on it? I've seen TXVs that were like 30 years old that mm. still were going good. Mm. So when the guy would cut out that and put in the fixed orifice, mm. he had to take all the refrigerant out? Mm -hmm. Wow. That's a serious hatred for That's a serious hatred, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he made more work for himself because he didn't like it. And then probably charge that person for it too. Like, oh, probably, yeah. It took me two hours to be ours. Yeah. So, anyways, gives you an idea about that TXV. So, we're going to go back to the lab. Oh, um, so we want to check subcooling. Now, this is also a, a number, it's important. Usually, there's a tag on the units, and somewhere in that tag, there's a lot of information. But you look for something that says TXV or TXV subcooling or something subcooling, and it'll have a number on there. And that number could be as low as 6 or as high as 12, or even I've seen it as high as 16 before. Whatever that number they say is the number you go with. But the particular ones we have, I'm pretty sure they don't have a subcooling number posted on them. So if it doesn't say, you should contact the manufacturer and find out what subcooling they want. But if it's in the middle of the night and you can't get a hold of anybody, you need to get it going, a, a typical general number that people go with is 10 to 12. So let's just say that for the unit, for example, we're just going to go with 10 degrees of subcooling. What we're going to do is we're going to go out to the lab and we're going to check our subcooling on the system. We're going to let it run a little bit just for a few minutes. Let it balance out. We're going to check our subcooling and see what it's at. And then after we know our subcooling is good, then we'll check our super heat to see how our TXV is doing. Okay? And then we'll decide what's going on with the system. We'll look at our super heat and we'll see if it's flooded, good, or starved. We'll look at our uh, suction line or super heat and see if it's uh, good, bad, or different, uh, flooded, uh, starved, or good. And then we'll decide if we need to add refrigerant, remove refrigerant, or if there's some other problem. All right, so let's go to the lab.